Hello, apes. Welcome to Unit 1, the Global Ecosystem. We're going to be starting off with ecology. Most of this should be a review for everyone coming from biology. Uh, we're going to be studying the biosphere, and that is basically the region where living things are found in the Earth, from the bottom of the oceans to the upper atmosphere. Biosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, and geosphere are the uh, four different spheres of the Earth, and we're going to start out with the biosphere. Uh, talking about biological complexity, we have uh, organism is the smallest that we study, and then it goes all the way up to the biosphere. So your population is made up of uh, different organisms, your community is made up of populations, your ecosystem is made up of communities, etc., 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 all the way down to your different your one organism. Ecosystems are made up of physical environments and the communities that live in them. They consist of biotic and abiotic factors. So your biotic are all your living things, all your abiotic factors are your non-living things. And then that brings us to ecology, which is the study of the relationships and the interactions between their abiotic and their bi biotic environment. So ecology means your interactions there. Habitat uh, is different from niche, but people tend to confuse them. And habitat is just the physical place where an organism, organism lives. It gives them a lot of different resources to survive, food and water, mating sites, nesting sites, things like that. Niche is different. Niche is habitat and adaptations and act activity patterns and the physical conditions where and how the organism feeds. And all of these different things comprise an organism's niche. This leads to competitive exclusion, also known as Gauss's law or Gauss's principle. So two species that compete for the same resource at the same time in the same place are going to compete with each other. So this, they cannot exist indefinitely. So ultimately you have resource partitioning that occurs. So here's a nice image of resource partitioning. You have all of these different warblers that want to live and feed in this tree. So you have five different species and they all need to coexist with each other. So what happens is they either physically break down the tree's location or they feed at different times. When you're thinking of the community at Marlboro High School, all of the students need to eat. However, the cafeteria is not big enough for them to all eat at the same time. So what we do is we partition this resource. We have four different lunches to accommodate all of the students. Everybody gets to eat. They just do it at different times in the same location. Same thing with these warblers. They're uh, physical location may overlap, but they're feeding at different times. Or maybe they're feeding in the same location, but one's taking the right side of the tree and the other one's taking the left side, or they're feeding higher or lower on the tree. So fundamental and realized niche is basically um, resource partitioning. So your fundamental niche is the full range of environmental conditions that an organism can live in. It would be fun to live anywhere in the world as humans. And as humans, we basically can live anywhere. But you've realized that you live in Marlboro, and you live in Marlboro for one reason or another. So this is the niche that is actually occupied. It is usually narrower than the fundamental niche. And here we can see in this image barnacles, which is what everybody uses as the example for fundamental and realized niche. So you can see the fundamental niches uh, the fundamental niche of these little guys up here is this whole area, whereas the fundamental niche of the big guys is this area. Okay, So they actually occupy their whole fundamental niche because they're big and they're bullies, whereas these little guys up here get pushed up to the upper portion of their fundamental niche. And so this here is their realized niche. They've realized that they can't outcompete these big bully guys down here. Law of tolerance is something similar. So uh, for each abiotic factor, an organism has a range of tolerance. So here, let's say for trout, um, this is their range of tolerance. They prefer to be here in the middle, but they can live here and they can live here if they have to. Okay, their optimum main range is in the middle. If they go out over here, they're going to die or they're going to want to avoid this area. So example of abiotic factors, you have uh, pH. Uh, a lot of this is in water. It's either too acidic or too alkaline, but right in the middle, Goldilocks, it's just right. Over here, you have too cold, too hot. In the middle, it's just right. We also see the same thing with dissolved oxygen. Natural selection. 
um, comes from genetic variations or mutations that cause different traits. So favorable traits say an organism is going to live and it's going to be fit um, to reproduce to ensure there's a future generation. So these traits are your adaptations. This was Darwin's thing in the 19th century. And we have different evidence for natural selection. And most of it is fossil evidence. Um, through the fossil record, we can see how organisms have actually changed over time. Now, natural selection is not to be confused with artificial selection, which is manipulated selection, like breeding dogs. Okay? The big thing you need to remember is natural selection leads to evolution. Evolution is this thing that takes a long, long time. Uh, natural selection can take, you know, a couple generations for these traits to um, be expressed, whereas evolution is uh, a long, long time. We're talking hundreds, thousands of years. So natural selection on a population. This is a really great way to show how the trait can change. So we have directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. This dotted line you can see here is your, uh, your general uh, middle of the road thing. So directional selection is where um, the population after the selection goes in one direction. Okay, So we can see here it has a normal sized tail. However, if it starts growing a really long tail, it looks like a snake. It scares predators. The longer the snake, the more it scares it. So what happens is these um, tails start to grow through the generations because that's what they're being selected for. Stabilizing means you're going to have it right there in the middle. So uh, both extremes are selected against. So you obviously have a tiger here with a short tail it messes up the cat's balance with a long tail it, it drags on the ground so your happy medium here it's just right so you're gonna have a medium tail that's your stabilizing it's stabilized right in the middle whereas disruptive is you're gonna have a population on your right hand side and a left hand side so this squirrel here it has a short tail which means it's going to be good from uh, predator avoidance on the ground, whereas this squirrel has a long tail, which means it's going to have great balance for in the trees. Here's another great diagram. Take a minute and look at it. Uh, and then you have species. So when we're talking about species, these organisms interbreed with each other to produce viable offspring. Okay? Uh, mules are not a species. Mules are a horse and a donkey came together, and uh, when they had a baby, it's a mule. A mule cannot mate with another mule and create more mules. They're uh, sterile. They can't have babies. So speciation is this process by which a new species is formed. Sympatric happens uh, in the same area, usually to niche differentiation. So like resource partitioning, eventually those warblers that we saw may become new species because they're feeding at different times and over time they'll become a new species. And allopatric is the main type. This is Darwin's finches. They were separated with geographic separation on different islands. Okay, So one bird on an island, another bird on another island, they say allo to each other because they're separated by something geographic like an ocean. Coevolution is really cool because the change of one object triggers the change of a related object. So you see really funky things like this moth who is only adapted to eat on this one specific orchid. So very, very specific. Uh, it's good because it's really cool looking and we have these organisms that have adapted over time. However, if this orchid goes extinct, bye-bye moth. And if this moth goes extinct, bye-bye orchid because the orchid isn't going to be pollinated. Okay, that's part one.